Hey, what's up people? Uh, just stopping in for another live stream episode. I'm going to be sketching this, uh, this head up here. And uh, this is going to be on IG and this is going to be on YouTube as well. So if you're on IG and you're watching this, honestly, probably you want to watch it on, uh, on YouTube. If anybody lets me know the sound's okay, that also sets my mind at ease. Um, but hopefully everything about the broadcast is going to go exactly like it's supposed to go. Um, also like any questions that you, that you have about, uh, about what I'm up to, you can definitely just chime in and ask, chuck them into the comments and, uh, I'll get to them as soon as I can see it. Um, I am today actually working with colored pencils. If you follow my IG feed, probably you'll be aware that I've been doing some stuff with that lately. Um, and this is kind of a continuation of that. I'm also like kind of starting this out with a, uh, with a Loomis type head here. And, um, yeah, so that's also just something you should know as well. You know, this also, by the way, this Loomis thing is going to be a part of the upcoming live workshop that I've got. So if you're subscribed to my Patreon already, don't even worry about it because you are in on, on the inside of that. Uh, if you are not, uh, I'm going to be doing a live workshop. A lot of cool stuff in it. A couple questions uh, rolling in already. Uh, someone was asking, Joe was asking, what's your verdict on tempera painting? you know, it might still be too early to call it a verdict, but I'll give you my thoughts. Uh, so I have been doing some experiments with, with tempera, kind of trying to figure out, you know, how I fit into it, I guess. <laughs> um, part of how I fit into it is that I think it's a great medium for like layering. And so, you know, I love, I love all that stuff. Um, but I feel like certainly the commercial tempera that is sold, uh, for instance, by Sennelier, um, I like a lot of their products. I can't profess to really like much about that, that tubed egg tempera. I think it's probably, to me, it doesn't seem to behave much in any different way than, than gouache does. So, uh, for me, that was a non-starter. But I understand that like proper egg tempera is quite a different story. And so I'll be eventually, um, uh, eventually I'll be working with proper egg tempera, getting into eggs. I'm also kind of, and this is like, by the way, you just asked what I thought of tempera. I'm like going into like a whole other world of topics. But the thing I want to mention is that actually, so the problem I'm trying to solve you know, in terms of like why I'm even getting into those materials is because I want something that gives me the possibility to kind of layer in the way that I do when I'm working, say, in um, like in watercolor or in any kind of aqueous medium where you can do like I've even painted in acrylic. So, you know, that, like there's a lot of possibilities for like kind of layering because these these mediums dry so quickly. So I thought, well, if egg tempera could extend a little bit the drying time uh, of, say, like a gouache, or like if, if egg tempera was like a little bit slower than gouache, then maybe I could like model some form and get some joy out of it that way. I didn't find that to be the case. I think with proper egg tempera, maybe it'd be more of a case, but I, I think I might kind of attack this from a different direction and actually try to instead of getting something to like uh, slow down tempera drying that I might just accelerate oil drying uh, because a lot of the transitions and things that I get from oil paint I really I really like uh, it's just that I want more layering and uh, I'm not getting it and so I think what I'm going to get into is um, you know, integrating different dryers into, into my oil painting. So I'll probably be using maybe some cobalt dryer, maybe, uh, some other kind of sicatives and things that are, 
that are going to get that oil paint to be dry enough that that it's time effective basically to do like a lot of layers on a on a painting so that's uh, that's how it was with egg tempera the other option obviously is to take egg tempera and extend it and you can do something that uh, is called or you can make something a medium uh, called tempera grassa which is like uh, fat tempera in, in Italian and this was a medium that Pietro Anagoni was famous for using and I even have from a little shop that I uh, used to go to in Florence called Zecchi. Sandro is the guy that, that runs it and he still has actually photocopies of the the formula for the medium that uh, Anagoni used and uh, eventually I, I got one of those uh, I got a copy of that from him so um, it's like a medium that is like with egg and oil and like mastic varnish and a few other different additives that, that maybe one day I'll kind of bring to fruition and use. Um, uh, but like I said, that's like slowing down tempera instead of like speeding up oil. So that's where I'm at with it right now. Uh, a lot of different questions uh, jumping in. And uh, let's see. By the way, I'm going to try to kind of keep the questions a little bit on topic. So... Um, like in general, like questions probably about drawing. If you're curious about things like the paper that I'm using or like kind of what materials that I use, this time around I put a link to my FAQs on um, in the in the description of this video on YouTube. So if you if you're interested in stuff like that, really all the information is there, and it's uh, so much easier to get to than. Um, than me like kind of answering it over and over but I'm using I'll just mention briefly I'm using a Bristol paper and uh, this is a Derwent Graphitin pencil but I got a few different uh, colored pencil uh, brands that I'm using right so let's see <laughs> yeah a couple of people are asking if this uh, live stream is pre-announced you know, I'm just not in a place at the moment where I can like always pre-announce a stream, unfortunately. It's just like, you know, I have a lot of responsibilities teaching, you know, a lot of one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, uh, you know, every month I'm producing like a brand new tutorial from, from scratch. So that means that like eventually, I, you know, when it comes to these streams, it's just kind of time that I can steal and um and kind of come in and do a quick stream while i'm while i get my drawing time for the day basically right um so unfortunately at the moment i can't say that i can like promise a time when they're going to be i think in the future i'm going to get a little bit more strict about it and i'll probably start announcing them at the beginning of the month like every month i do a news and updates on my patreon so like what's going on that month and like what am I getting up to, you know, what tutorials am I working on uh, and stuff like that. So I think what I'll start doing is I'll start kind of announcing them in that bulletin, right? So um, the February announcement will be coming up pretty soon. So like what's happening in February, uh, which by the way, the Drawing Essentials Workshop Part 2 is coming up in February. February 1st, it's available to all patrons that are subscribed at the $10 level and up. And uh, what we're going through basically is, um, I'm going through and unpacking the entirety of the like beginner curriculum, right, for, for drawing as, as it was when I studied at the academy. And I'm also kind of shedding light on my thoughts on like that, that part of the journey, right? So when you're, when you're starting out, as an artist, you can, um, it can be very helpful to you to have a little bit of a glimpse of like the big picture. What does all of your education look like? What are the topics that before you get out of the beginner section, you need to have sorted out? Um, and that's what this workshop is about. It's really highly informational. Um, and it's going to relate also to some of the practical demos that uh, certainly are on my site. Um, but uh, like in this one, for instance, we'll be going into intermediate and uh, advanced bar drawings. And we're also going to talk about the Loomis head. I said I started this out with a little bit of a, um, what I would call like a, a Loomis light head. <laughs> um, 
and I'm gonna go it through and kind of unpack like all the things that I find useful about Loomis, which actually was not something really involved in my in my education. Uh, you know, when I went to, to school and studied, it was all um, it was all very observational, which is to say, like the Loomis head is a conceptual model, and we were very much like uh, raised <laughs> to uh, distrust conceptual models. And, um, you know, as time has gone on, I've kind of realized that conceptual models can be like really, really, really useful uh, if you want to actually get some work done. So I've adopted a lot of things um, uh, in Loomis's teaching, which, by the way, like, I kind of came across Loomis by realizing that I needed my own kind of template for the head. And so I was kind of blocking in, I wouldn't say with Loomis concepts, but if you're conceptualizing a head, there's only a few ways you're going to do it. You're going to start with that center line idea, which is fundamental to Loomis. And so it was actually through that, that I started kind of thinking about Loomis and kind of learning about Loomis. Like I was already, trying to conceptualize the head and I realized, oh, he's got this great kind of conceptual model that already exists, you know, uh, and I can kind of take parts of that in and kind of strengthen my own conceptual model. So uh, I thought it would be worthwhile for, for my students on Patreon, like to uh, get a leg up basically on, um, on Loomis and what I think you're going to get out of him that's that's going to be really uh, really useful um, but that's all coming up February 1st and um, you can check it out on uh, on Patreon and uh, that's that a lot of questions coming in uh, let's see a lot of people saying I need to announce these more in advance I, I know I know I will sometime but it's just not uh, uh, there right now uh, C. Langley is saying, it's really interesting to see you experiment with new mediums. Any plans to play around with acrylic? Ah, fair question. Uh, not at present. I wouldn't say that I have a present plan to, to mess around with acrylic, though I can res I yeah, definitely respect what it can do, and I have used it in the past, um, both before being educated and, and kind of post-education. Um, but it, it, for me, it has a lot of the same difficulties that actually uh, I find that tempera has in that it it dries just a little bit too fast to properly model form and uh, and so that for me eventually is a little bit of a problem also the fact that like it kind of it will also like dry on your palette too and you know you kind of I don't know there's some problems that I find like personally with it that's just uh, that's just me Kevin Haler is asking, do you ever fix your drawings in the early stages to bind a layer that you can draw over? I never have. I'm kind of curious about, you know, this was always brought up whenever I heard about this. It was in relationship to like trying to get quite a darker value, like with, um, uh, with charcoal, for instance. And the idea was that you would use like a workable fixative and that would like kind of seal the charcoal onto the surface and then you could kind of work over a little bit more uh, to get like a little bit of a darker value. Uh, so while I feel like I've heard of it, I've never really pursued it. Probably it's interesting. I just, uh, just don't know. I haven't done it. Uh, Joe's asking what draws me to colored pencils. Um, I think that I just like some of the effects that you can get like with a duotone surface and also like they're kind of like a less messy sanguine or sepia chalk. You know, um, uh, sepia chalk is something that I've, I've drawn with before and I really enjoy. Um, you know, I like kind of working with it. I think it's, it's, it's really beautiful. It has a high ceiling in terms of its expressivity. You know, it's a beautiful expressive medium, but it is also like a giant mess. <laughs> Um, and so, uh, colored pencils are a way that you can address a little bit this, uh, desire for like, a, a duochrome, uh, coloration in a, in a drawing, which is to say like a, you know, a little bit of a color expression, uh, without having the, um, the complications of, uh, of sepia chalk, 
which like I said, I really enjoy for like a longer form drawing. But uh, if you wanted to, like in this instance, if you wanted to do like shorter drawings, and that's kind of what I, what I want to get into right now is kind of drawings that resolve a little bit faster um, and are a little bit more limited, but are also like still have that sense of being kind of expressive. You know, it's just, it's just a matter of like also like the time in your life. Like I've always had this problem that, you know, I never really made before like drawings that I thought were really cool very quickly. Like all my drawings that I would, I would do anything with, I would generally like take, you know, nine to 10 hours to, to make them. And so it kind of puts this limit a little bit on your creativity that, you know, you can't like churn through a lot of interesting imagery very fast. So it's a lot of like pre-planning in your work and a lot of like investment every time you start an image. I wanted something that was a little bit lower time investment uh, so I could just kind of experiment with some of the ideas that I have, some of the thoughts that I have about, uh, you know, head composition and construction and design, like all the stuff that's kind of floating around in my imagination. Um, I needed a way to kind of get that out a little bit faster. And so colored pencils, I feel like offer me that possibility of, uh, you know, kind of creating a drawing that's a little bit more finished. Is it finished? I don't know, but um, a little bit more finished, uh, a little bit faster. Um, so, so I think that, and, and also like I've always, I always have a desire to kind of work a little bit with color. Um, but I'm someone I really like a, you know, I'm really fond of like very limited color. And it's also obviously something that color pencils gives you is the possibility to like make a drawing out of just a, a couple of colors um, and have them kind of resonate in a particular way with each other. Like, you know, I've got this kind of magenta colored pencil here that's kind of interesting for creating some like fleshy tones in in certain areas so anyway that's just the the motivation for me bit of color um let's see oh so many questions um oscar jim is saying have you ever intentionally drawn something out of proportion for expressive effect a bit like how lucian freud sacrifices rendering or how sergeant payton lewis robert lewis stevenson uh have i ever yeah, i mean I have accepted a little bit uh, um, more like how I want something to look rather than how it does look. Uh, whether whether it's full on, you know, like taking that artistic leap to uh, to sacrifice proportions um, is debatable. And I'm just saying like it's debatable that I was that expressive. Uh, but yeah, like I've accepted that there's there's certainly like a way that I want something to look and sometimes it doesn't look that way and sometimes I'm gonna make it look that way <laughs> which is uh, uh, something I I'm totally okay with and I think that you know as you as you grow into actually like being an artist making artwork I think it's something that you can ask yourself like ultimately do you believe that the empirical uh, expression or appearance of something is what you love about it or is it something more about how you feel about it you know that that represents more what you love about it and I guess I, I bring that up because you know I feel like the idiosyncrasy of an artist you know it's it's not like a new idea by the way talking about artistic vision you know we're talking about idiosyncrasy you know I've, I've at times felt like that really is the key to to what makes a drawing or painting interesting is is how that particular artist you know what do they like about it what do they emphasize about it and that has you know um what's the word that has i don't want like i'm saying this i don't want to get into one of these things where i'm like i think it's this way and like you can only be expressive if you change everything it's just about depending upon like who you are, like what do you find most um, meaningful in something to you, you know? And so if you work with a subject, like a lot of times, you know, I'm making portraits of people 
you know, in a way, like a lot of murders, this is just a professional model that I that I worked with uh, when we lived in Jersey City. Uh, so it's not someone actually, per I mean, personal, personal to me. Uh, she has a face and aesthetic and appearance that I that I appreciate for sure. But, you know, it's not that it's not like the face of my 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 mother, my wife, my brother, you know, um, this is somebody that that I interact with for aesthetic purposes. And so in that instance, maybe the most important thing is like what I find interesting about it, not necessarily what is most personal to that that individual. Um, so it depends upon the circumstances. I would say, yes, I've done it. And uh, yes, I support the, the doing of it. But, you know, it just is up to every individual. Like, what do you feel? What do you feel about your subject? You know, what do you feel is like the thing you appreciate most about it? Yeah. So Toby Michael is asking, have you read Solomon J. Solomon's The Practice of Oil Painting and Drawing? If so, could you unpack his position on blocking in a drawing? I read it and couldn't fully grasp his take on it. That's such a cool question. I have probably only skimmed that book ever. I, I've never actually owned um, I never actually owned his particular text on uh, on drawing and painting, so I, I unfortunately cannot comment on it, but it's exactly the kind of thing I do love to comment on. So uh, maybe I'll have to just uh, take it and say that there will come a time when I'll, I'll come to that because uh, he is a favorite artist of mine. Um, had a lot to say about drawing and painting, and uh, I believe that both myself and, as well, my students could probably really, really benefit from that. So let's see. Uh, IF was asking, what figure drawing book do you suggest for beginners? Uh, I do have a recommended reading list on my FAQ, so I'm just going to refer you there. Um, there's a bunch of great ones, and... Um, you know, I've just set out like a kind of primer list of, of, of beginner books that I think work uh, across the board. Yeah, the FAQ link, by the way, is in the uh, description of this of this uh, video on uh, on YouTube. So you'll be able to find it there. Chris N is asking, any advice for making personal art? I feel like I'm always working craft, getting better at skills, but not making finished works of art that express myself. Well, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a little bit complicated um, uh, to say. You know, making personal art. You know, I'm a a big believer that um, the there there's like kind of two timelines happening. Like there is the timeline where you, as a human, are uh, maturing and growing older. And there is a similar timeline um, where you as an artist are like maturing and growing older. And that some of the things, you know, there are some commonalities in that, right? Like when you're a teenager, you know, as a, as a person, everything is like really just dramatic and like, you know, your emotions are like all over the map. Uh, I mean, if you're like me... <laughs> If you're like me, they, they are. Um, and so you find yourself sometimes feeling like a bit of a leaf in the breeze. And you can feel a little bit unmoored, uncentered. Uh, as an artist, I know that we go through that phase too. I know certainly like I went through that phase. Uh, just feeling like the slightest breeze would like blow me over, you know, in terms of... Um, uh, in terms of like what what kind of art I wanted to make that that day of the week, you know, and so I feel like as an artist you need to mature a little bit, and 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 this is the difficult thing. I mean, obviously nobody wants to wait for anything, but I I do think you need to like mature a little bit in terms of experience, in terms of like making drawings, you know. Um, it reminds me of this. Well, I'll save that story for another time. I have a Chuck Close story, um, and it's kind of relevant to this. But uh, yeah, I'll, I'll say I'll hold on to that one just to say, just to finish my thought about this. In a way, you first of all, you already are expressing yourself. I, I believe firmly that when you're drawing, because of the process of like making a drawing. 
is one of memorization, right? Like I can't actually look at the source image I'm using and my paper and draw like at the same time. So what I do is I naturally, I look at what I'm drawing and I memorize it as much as I am able. And I reproduce what I remember of it on my, uh, on my paper. So <laughs> I'm going to get so in the weeds talking about this. Uh, let me just try and simplify it. I'll just try and give you like the simplest possible version because I'm someone who probably over explains stuff anyway. The point I'm trying to make is this. You remember most the things that you most identify with or you find most significant. Everybody will find different things to be the most significant based on their life and their life experiences. So when you are drawing something and memorizing those significant aspects of it, you are drawn, of course, to the things that are most significant and interesting to you. And I would then say that due to that fact, you are inevitably expressing yourself when you make a drawing. Now, when you're a student, that can feel a little bit funny because the things that are really important to you are usually just technical considerations. And by the way, probably that's kind of what it should be when you're a student. Like, you're just supposed to be like figuring out how things work. And if while you're trying to figure out how things work, you're maybe preoccupied with um, this uh, obviously very important question of expression, you know, sometimes it, one can work against the other. Now, this is like the hardcore art teacher stuff where it sounds like I'm saying, don't worry about expressing yourself, just get to work. Um, <laughs> and I wouldn't say I'm exactly saying that, um, but I am saying that you can also trust the certainty, really, that, that the expression is there and that as you mature as an artist, you will come to understand your feelings a little bit better. Just like to, to go back to this metaphor uh, that I was uh, trying to describe between a person growing older and maturing. You know, you grow older, you get a lot more in touch with your feelings. You know, you realize that something was just a phase that you were going through and, and you know, that sometimes that's how things are and you got to go through those phases and that's fine and that's good. But, you know, like you're going to experience that in your life as an artist as well. I've been through a lot of phases in my life as an artist where I thought, oh, I love this. In fact, maybe that's even the story of like, you know, me finding my own way to do things was that I was very aware that I'm, I'm always like drawn to something and I'm very get very excited about one thing or the other. Uh, but in time, that thing reveals itself to you, I think, to be something real or, in a way, maybe just a mirage. And that's, uh, by the way, and that's totally fine. So, a lot of questions coming in. Let me see if I can get to, uh, to one. Varun Tulsian? Yeah, Tulsian says, Hey Stephen, what difference do you find between rough and smooth paper for drawing? Which do you prefer? I like smoother for a lot of reasons. Um, MJ is asking, what advice do you give students studying your figure drawing tutorial? I'm a bit confused on applying your anatomical notation since you have no background or since this person has no background in anatomy yet. Um, there's anatomy that you can observe and there's anatomy that you can know. So like looking at this face, you know, we don't need, like, no, like saying the nose, the lips, the eye, this, this is anatomy, like, actually just, I mean, it sounds very simple, but uh, also just things that you can see if you're drawing a nude figure. Uh, in, in the case of that tutorial that you're talking about, the nude male figure, of course, there we're talking about the uh, pectoral muscles, like the, the muscles of the chest. You don't even need to necessarily know the names to start observing them. In the end, you'll learn the names, but at the start, it's not like you have to have a vocabulary uh, that is unabridged to kind of know a little bit of what you're looking for. Um, so just start with the idea of basic structural symmetry. If you see something on one side, draw it on the other side. And in doing so, uh, I think a lot of notations, a lot of opportunities to observe anatomy are going to um, present themselves to you. and. Uh, so that, that can be, I think, very 
very helpful to consider, you know. Um, good to know the names. Is knowing the names the only way to work with it? Not exactly. Let's see, Ben White is asking, whenever I'm mapping out the head alongside the shoulders, I always find that I'm making the face too small. Well, you know, that's, um, of course, that's not a question, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> but um, I think oftentimes when you're, you're finding that you have a proportional error, it um, usually has to do with how well you're describing something at a particular stage. Um, in the beginning, a drawing can be quite abstract. We're just talking about like a, a flat piece of, in this case, like white paper. Um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of ways that you can, you can mess up proportion. But in general, like I feel like a lot of it has to do with recognition. So if your blocking of the head doesn't look enough like a head or enough like the head that you're trying to draw, you can experience more difficulty, I think, unlocking the proportions of it. Uh, and that usually has to do with the uh, expertise the, that you have uh, in terms of, you know, utilizing something like, for instance, like a Loomis head. Uh, the cool thing about Loomis heads is that even from the very start, they're very recognizable. So that allows you to, I think, do a lot in terms of proportion very early on. Um, and thus, it gives you a massive uh, head start. <laughs> head start, wow, no pun intended. Uh, in, uh, in getting your proportions kind of locked in where you, where you want them to be, um, rather than uh, you know, just drawing a head that's purely like a set of visual shapes, which can, uh, for a while even, appear quite, um, quite abstract. Let's see, Julio Cesar is asking, do you ever feel a drawing was a failure and then two, three days later when you dare to glance at it again, suddenly feels better and salvageable? Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a thing probably we can all relate to, you know, um, so many of these things as well. Um, you know, I guess these like fears um, uh, in drawing or these difficulties in drawing, they are definitely things that we, that we all experience, you know. Um, just maybe we don't all uh, always have the opportunity to kind of talk about them. So, uh, yeah, man, I've totally felt that way for sure. No, no doubt at all. Let's see. Uh, Kyber Kylo seventy seven asks: Besides recording your work, what other ways can you? What other ways to prove against paint over accusations on digital? I'm probably not really qualified to answer that, unfortunately. But um, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't have an answer for that one. Sorry. Uh, Tapendra Shahi is asking, can you please tell us how to map the shadow and and shade them? Um, yes, uh, but also like I've made a whole tutorial about doing that, um, and so probably unpacking all that here is. Uh, uh, it's maybe too in depth uh, an information to uh, to really go into. Um, I would I would highly recommend uh, that you just get that access that tutorial, which uh, like I said is on Patreon. Um, really, the subscription is only ten dollars a month. You can cancel at any time. So like literally, you could sign in, you know, um, uh, put in your information, uh, whatever, watch the video, and then unsubscribe immediately like uh, but it, it is quite in-depth there's projects that go along with it and um, and there's there's a lot to it it's also something that I unpack in great depth in my uh, in part one of the drawing essentials series uh, which like I said part two is coming out February 1st um, and we're gonna got like dive deeper into topics exactly like that so if that's the kind of vibe that you're on and that's where you want to be, um, I, I can just say that it's very uh, budgetable and very accessible. So probably uh, got to find that one there. Let's see, uh, MJ is asking, what are the common questions students at the academy mostly ask? Well, students at the academy, the Florence Academy specifically, were mostly studying site size. So a lot of their questions early on are like, how on earth does site size work? 
and uh, uh, you know how do I um, how do I get better at that? Uh, you know, it's not like they're they're actually in a way like that remarkable of questions. Um, you know, most of the time it's just you know very common stuff like you would uh, you would talk about here. You know, so much of the focus uh, at that school is also about trying to um, trying to get uh, students to abstract a little bit more what they're seeing. So uh, there's a lot of focus on their work individually. I mean, if there's something that that you get there, um, it is like individual work. So like your instructor is coming around, uh, you know, usually see them two times a day, uh, probably you get about, uh, you know, five to, I mean, depending upon the size of your problems, five to 10 minutes of, uh, of like individual critique uh, per day. That's five days a week, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you have an evening class, maybe you get another, uh, you know, another five minutes or so of uh, individual critique as well. So a lot of it's just about exactly what you're going through. And, and so, you know, frankly, I, the questions probably are most often just related to the critique they're getting. So it's, um, yeah, I don't know if there's like a, a great answer kind of unlocked by that, unfortunately. Let's see. Zinadia Pavlovna, 377, is asking, do you have a crisis time when you can't draw? Uh, I have a crisis time when I don't have time to draw, and I get really annoyed, and um, and I kind of wish that I uh, could, like, <laughs> I wish I could just, like, hire an army of people to do all the stuff that I, I have to do, um, and then all I would have to do is draw. Uh, but unfortunately, that is not the life of an adult, so, uh, yeah, sure. Um, Baby J one two three four five one asks, "What part of your creative process do you find yourself being impatient with? The block and rendering or lighting?" That is a really, I really like that question. Like, because it taps into something that is very true, and it's that I get very annoyed uh, with with myself or my process um, when I'm kind of uh, when I'm getting something wrong, kind of over and over. I think that. Probably the part that I, I would get most frustrated with myself about, because it's really we're talking about like getting frustrated with yourself. I mean, I know we're saying process, but I'm the one responsible for my process. So I put a lot of that uh, that weight just on um, just on me. Uh, what part of it? I mean, I think, you know, w when I look at my work and I assess my work, I'm always thinking like, ah. Oh, you know, the design there, like, could have been so much better. And what I mean by that is, like, how cool a shape is. You know, there's just shapes. Like, you look at Phil Hale's work, right? Like, everybody knows that painter, Phil Hale. If you don't know Phil Hale, uh, go find out about Phil Hale's work. It's fantastic. He just put a book out. Probably I should do, like, a book review on it at some point. But he just put a book out uh, of his work, and uh, all of it's incredible, and all of it's amazing. And, um, you know, if you look at, like, the refinement of his sense of, like, shape design in his work, it's just, like, so over-the-top good. Uh, so what I'm usually annoyed about is, like, I'll look at some work like that and go, like, oh, man, come on, Steve, like, my design couldn't be that, uh, that good, you know? I couldn't, uh, couldn't pull off, like, a Phil Hale, um you know, set of shape designs, but, uh, you know, there is also that sense that, like, comparison, I think this is like a, a Jack Kerouac line, uh, back when I used to read uh, Jack Kerouac, I think he said, uh, comparisons are odious, which is to say they suck, and I think that there's also been other, like, um, uh, places I've read and heard things in my life, and you kind of put two and two together, uh, but but the reality is, like, comparisons, whether they're odious or not, they are lacking in usually one pretty critical component, uh, and that is, like, the data that you've been able to uh, use in order to create the comparison. 
like taking Phil Hale, for instance. For one thing, like he's older than I am. He's had more experience and more time uh, drawing and painting. So that's one difference. Another difference, he trained in probably a completely different way. I know like early on, I think he was uh, um, like a, a comic artist, right? That wasn't my training. I didn't train like that. So once again, yet another data point, you know, in the comparison that that maybe is, you know, creates room for a little bit of uh, a bit of difference. Now, maybe it sounds like I'm like giving myself, you know, a free pass to not be as good as Phil Hale. Maybe so, maybe not. But just to say like, when you compare your, your work to somebody else's work, you know, a lot of times you're not going to be framing it in a way that is going to create a, like a fair or reasonable comparison. So might may or may not be useful to you. Let's see. Uh, Philip Luthi is asking, Stephen, hypothetical question. If you make a painting and a drawing, both the same size, and you put the same amount of time into both of them, do you think they both have the same value or should have? Um, as an artist who works in uh, both mediums and has a tremendous affection for, uh, for drawing as a medium, I say, absolutely. Will the real world dictate that you will be able to get the same value for them? Probably not. I, I think, I would speculate, I would theorize that that has a lot to do with, um, with history, with uh, drawing being primarily a preparatory medium due to the, the permanence of oil paint and the fragility of, uh, of paper. Um, I think we're still living out the kind of manifest uh, expression of, of, of that early relationship in between um, drawing and painting. So uh, uh, do I think they have the same value? Yes. Uh, however, if we're talking um, business wise, will you be able to um, will you be able to receive the same value for them? Uh, well, depends upon how good your drawings are. <laughs> if you make the most amazing drawing, you put a huge price tag on it, and you can get it, then uh, then of course you uh, you have done so. Um, however, you know you probably start out from a place where that's not as likely. Let's see a lot of qu ah scrolling is a lot of questions. Um, Doug Ferron uh, says before starting this question, this is a bit of a dumb question. When it comes to painting a portrait, how important is likeness? Have you ever considered restarting because you like the painting where it was? Uh, so it's kind of two questions. How important is likeness? Well, uh, you got to take that project by project. Um, so is your painting a commissioned portrait? If your painting is a commissioned portrait, likeness is going to be profoundly important and it is going to be the likely the focus of your client's evaluation of that work. If your painting is a student project and you're at a school and that school is like most atelier schools kind of focused on engendering like uh, accurate empirically observable truth in drawing and painting then it will be very important. <laughs> I think you see where I'm going with this. It just depends upon like what what the uh, the purpose of the work is. Like with these with these sketches, for instance, like the drawing I'm doing right now. I actually don't really think likeness is all that important. Like I'm 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 just way more interested in um, drawing the forms as I see them, uh, as I find myself interested in them, and uh, just kind of going with the flow a bit. Um, so not really, I'm not really, um, too bothered about, about likeness, uh, except for the fact that, you know, that's a part of, you know, my, my general appreciation in drawing. Like I quite enjoy, um, a drawing that has quite a bit of fidelity to nature. So, so it's necessarily going to be a bit of that, of that vibe. In the work that I make. So I'm like making this really tight shape here on the lip and I don't want to mess it up. So 
kind of uh, kind of <laughs> dialed in and focused on that. And I have an itch on my ear. Let's see. Uh, Tapendra Shahi is asking, do you have any video tutorial that demonstrates how to shade a portrait with graphite thoroughly? For sure, yeah, I have uh, several of them. Actually, one of this model uh, I've done that, that takes um, uh, shading or rendering in graphite really, really far. And um, uh, I think, you know, it's actually one of the, probably the my, my humble estimation, probably one of the best portraits I've, uh, I've made uh, was uh, fully rendered graphite. So, so there's several of them there, actually. You can kind of choose which one you like. And... Mena Magdi is asking, you suggest any books for drawing and painting? Totally. Check the FAQs in the description of this video and you will find uh, on those FAQs, on that FAQs post, you will find all the books that I recommend. Marceline Devan Camp, do I, Div uh, Marceline Devamp, I'm not going to read the last part of that, uh, asks, I'm watching this at my lunch break. Very cool. I hope you're dining on something very tasty. John Marble is asking, the jaw looks wrong, just saying. Thanks, John. Everybody likes an unsolicited critique. Um, all right, sorry. Sorry, I apologize, John. Um, I'm sure the jaw is a little bit off uh, as, I am, uh, as I'm working on this. Um, Mihir Bist is asking, what do you think of the Riley rhythms for head drawings? Do you ever use it? Riley's kind of a, a an interesting one um where like Riley's so so I was actually all right so I was I'm, I'm putting together my notes for the uh drawing essentials workshop and I'm talking about Loomis so naturally Riley kind of comes up uh, for those of you don't that don't know Riley I'm pretty sure I think it's Frank Riley was his name um uh quite well known instructor and um artist and he was um if you see his model it kind of looks highly impractical actually like it looks um uh it looks like something like wow that's like so baroque Why, when would i ever use like that much like conceptual information to uh um to kind of get to where i'm going um, which, by the way, just so you know, there is a little bit of like, um, uh, I'm filming this from above, but I'm also filming it a little bit at an angle like this. So I, I do feel like her head is looking a little bit wider than it actually looks on my, uh, on my paper. Um, so just to make a, a, a very slight excuse for myself there. Um, uh, I can try and like slim her up a little bit though. Uh, anyway, so back to Frank Riley. Um, if you see like his diagram for the head, like it looks, it looks kind of crazy, honestly. Like, it, and that's what I used to think of it. I used to think like, oh, Riley, that's like not interesting to me at all because like, it just looks like this crazy, weird diagrammatic head. But what Riley was talking about really was um, rhythms. Uh, so, and I, I, by the way, and I, I'm not even like, I'm definitely not like a Riley expert, not by a long shot. Uh, but he's talking about like the way that your pencil like kind of flows through the head and looking at these kind of different movements um, around the head that that are kind of relevant to creating a uh, building up a structure. Um, I just felt looking at them like, oh, there's definitely like in several easier ways to like um, to do this. So I don't really no, I don't really use them. Um, for the people that do like and use them, I think, yeah, totally cool. Um, but it's just not necessarily a thing for me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, they've been passed down for a long time, so it's not like, certainly not like they're without merit, right? Um, uh, and uh, a lot of people uh, long before me have kind of established the, uh, yeah, the utility of those, um, of those teachings, so... And, and by the way, I was going to mention also, like, so I was talking with um, uh, Stan Prokopenko about this. And he was saying that, uh, you know, for, for his take on it, um, that he felt like the idea of the Riley rhythms is really cool, but it's not that you necessarily need to use Riley's Riley rhythms. In a way, they're just idiosyncratic rhythms that he, he you know, found useful that, 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 that he uses. And you can kind of... In a way, you can kind of make your own. Let's see. 
um, layout Kim Studio says, is it camera angle or maybe the lens uh, that makes the drawing look wide? Yeah, I was just mentioning that the, um, like it is shot a little bit from above, there's a little bit of foreshortening. Uh, and also I'm kind of looking at it very slightly like from below, so like my head is like down here, right? Um, but definitely, by the way, it was, it's not like it wasn't too wide either. <laughs> so, so in a way, it's, uh, it's totally both. Um, let's see, Kevin Heller says, you draw these portraits to sell or only to use as tutorials? Well, these colored pencil ones, actually, I uh, at the moment, I really don't use for either. Um, but I was thinking, actually, that I kind of really like the aesthetic of them, and probably I should make them available for purchase uh, uh, at some point for a very reasonable price. But uh, but yeah, I mean, probably these will be eventual, uh, eventually available um, when I get around to um, kind of doing something about uh, about that. So if you have some ambition to, uh, to have one, uh, just stay tuned and uh, probably sometime I'll, I'll, I'll get around to that. Let's see. The end is asking, does it make sense to first learn portrait drawing before figure drawing or both at the same time? You know, the figure drawing thing is, is interesting. Obviously, it's a big part of my education, and uh, so I can advocate for, like, what parts of it are really useful. Um, I don't, you know, I mean, hey, listen, I went through it, so I can't tell you, uh, maybe, maybe don't go through it. Um, because I do think it contributes a lot to your like sense of, of design. However, uh, you know, learning figure drawing is like a whole big uh, can of worms that you need to kind of uh, unpack. Uh, if you're primarily interested in portraiture, I would almost say just focus on portraiture. Um, you know, because it's its own thing that has like takes plenty of time to uh, uh, to learn. So it's not like you're gonna like run out of stuff in portraiture to try to figure out. It's like a very, very deep um, uh, and unending well of challenges. Uh, and so I think learning them at the uh, the same time is probably just fine. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's obviously, you know, if you can do both and you're interested in both, then take both. Uh, you know, nothing nothing wrong with that. I, you know, there's this idea maybe that there's like a perfect way to study. It's not really a perfect way to study. It also depends on like what you're ready for, what your aptitudes are. Um, there are portrait artists that, you know, but then maybe they're not even really that great at figure painting. They took a stab at it and... Uh, it was not their area of expertise. A lot of it depends a little bit on your, uh, what's the word, like your enthusiasm for the subject as well. You know, uh, sometimes people will get into this game of like doing things that uh, that they know are good for them, but they're not really interested in. And so it actually limits uh, how, how good it is for you. Uh, Uziel Ipina, Ipina? is asking, would you say that it's in the unconscious mind that an artist finds the drive towards artistic expression? How aware of you are your emotions while working on an artistic project? The, so like when I'm actually working on an artistic project, uh, I actually try as much as possible to be very unemotional. And this is not to say that I don't desire an emotive result. And I'll, I'll unpack, this is actually kind of a, I'm glad you asked this because I have a lot to, to say about it. Um, so there's, I feel like this idea that art making is this really super passionate process. And while at its inception, obviously uh, you are drawn to something by some like passionate means. I would say, however, though, that when you're making a representational drawing, that there is a little bit of a sense that actually you need to be quite calm and focused while making that drawing rather than 
really excited and passionate. Now, of course, this will depend a little bit on the aesthetic you're chasing. For work that I make, if I'm like super excited and passionate all the time about what I'm doing, like if I'm just like, ah, I gotta be everywhere at this drawing at once, probably I'm going to wind up um, compromising a little bit the uh, the level of sophistication in the in the design that I'm able to make. So so that for me is something I, I actually try not to do. Uh, and the the place I like to kind of refer to, and it's like Think about it like making a movie, right? Like in a movie, obviously, you want to move the needle emotionally. But if the director is just like bouncing around off the walls and just responding emotionally to every little, you know, scene that passes by, not keeping a focus on the big picture, obviously that movie is going to lose a little bit of its sense of coherence. And with that in mind, you know, um, I try to you know, keep my eye on the big picture and not lose focus on on what the overall effect is, like while falling in love with some shape or some shading in the cheek, you know, and this is, of course, like this is like a, a public Q&A, so I know I'm out here just like giving opinions and kind of saying it like I think it is. I'm not saying everybody has to work this way, but... Um, but for me, I, I do find that, that there's times where if I'm actually a little bit too excited, uh, my work will, will suffer from it. Like I'll be a little bit too impulsive in some of the choices that I take and some of the shapes that I dive into. Uh, there's a lot of ways uh, or a lot of things that can kind of trip you up when you're, when you're working um, representationally, as I am. Uh, someone's asking, yeah, that's not a question. MJ is asking, uh, how are you, how are you doing not being to draw from life for, for a year now? Uh, it's okay, you know, um, I, 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 I look at that as more of just like a, um, I really enjoy drawing from life when I can, um, uh, you know, for practical reasons, like when you're filming, uh, tutorials very often, you're, you're just not, you're not gonna be able to just... Uh, and also, by the way, with COVID as well, as you as you say here, like it's not there's not really a lot of opportunity for that. But um, it's 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 fine to me. I survive it. There's a lot worse things to be deprived of. Uh, the end was asking if I prefer drawing or painting. Um, I don't know. It depends upon the day, I guess. You know, it depends upon the uh, kind of idea that I'm uh, obsessed with at the moment. I think right now a lot of my thinking is related to uh, related to drawing. Um, yeah, sorry, I was just reading through a few questions just to get to one. Um, uh, some of the questions are like a little bit vague, and so probably um, I'm I'm just searching for ones a little bit more specific. Uh, no offense to you if I uh, skip your question, but um, uh, Avol. Avalokit Alec Arts asks, if you were locked in a room with your incomplete artwork, how many hours can you spend in 24 hours? <laughs> this is a weird question. Um, uh, so how many hours out of 24 hours would I spend? And is like, there anything else in the room? Like, is it just me and the artwork? Or is there like a, is there like a couch? <laughs> can, I, can I like take a nap or... Or uh, or is it it's just me and the artwork uh, in a in a rubber room? Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess if it was the only thing there, I'd probably spend a, a ton of time on it. You know, uh, seeing as it sounds like otherwise, I might be pretty bored. Uh, so yeah, a lot of time is my answer. Uh, T one jump T I X says, "Hey Stephen, I really struggle with proportion." Do you think it's more viable to forgo rendering drawings further and focusing on doing studies that aren't really rendered but focus more on the block in? Yeah, totally. I mean, focusing on, on a block in is a really big part of your education. You know, um, a lot of times your drawing is not going to get uh, much better than what your block in allows it to. So uh, it's like you can, 
you can't make a great drawing in the block end, but you can mess up a drawing in the block end. <laughs> so like if you're um, if you're uh, drawing and you dive into rendering too soon and you your proportions are not maybe what they should be, uh, definitely you're gonna like have some regret about that like later on in the process, like for sure. Um, I mean that much is just proven by history, right? Um, but like if you do like a really great block in, you still have like a long way to go before that's gonna be like a great portrait. So like I said, I feel like you can mess it up in the uh, in the beginning, but you can't you can't guarantee an amazing drawing in the beginning. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry, I just a uh, bunch of questions uh, popping in here. Uh, vacant 35 says, can you explain the reliance on the use of straight lines over curves? Is it just simply, uh, is it just simplicity or is there more to it? Cool question. Um, and in a way, I would say that I definitely believe that there is more to it, for sure. Um, also because it's the foundation of a kind of visual language. And once you kind of get into that visual language, uh, it becomes like the way that you speak and uh, out of it, like a lot of things kind of emanate outward from that, you know? So at its inception, it's about simplicity, like at the first moment. But over, over time, it becomes other things as well. Uh, I think it you start to see very well how it how it lends itself to creating a sense of like structure in a drawing, right? Uh, a sense of clear three dimensionality, and when you expand on that, you start to realize, you know, drawing and painting. It's not always just mimicking how something or like mimicking what something looks like. It's it's using the language that you have to give the impression of how that thing is, which I know it sounds like the same thing, but there's a very subtle kind of difference in between the two uh, that I think, I think in the long term is observable. So uh, at the start, yeah, I mean, it is just about, listen, let's learn how to make this thing simple. Uh, the more that you kind of get into that, the more that you like buy into that, the more that you kind of discover there's other possibilities inside it as well. Sorry, just uh, focusing in for a second on on this. Um, right, so let's see. AM Design says, hello, Stephen. I'm an architect and a fine art major. Um, sorry, I'm just doing this line before I read the rest of your question. <laughs> it's distracted by drawing while I'm doing a Q and A. Um, because of the power of Jeremy Mann's cityscapes, how do you feel about him in general, his monographs, etc.? Uh, obviously, like a hugely influential, very expressive artist. Um, you're not gonna certainly not gonna catch me like going, oh, he's a bum. <laughs> like he's out there working really hard and and kind of making amazing work uh you know if it's just for my uh for my taste just the question of what i uh what i like there's some of his work i find very powerful and like there is with any professional artist you know there's some that uh you feel like it's it's a little bit like on repeat which again um there's not a denigration of him like so much of being a professional artist is you know, figuring out how to how to hit a note, uh, kind of over and over, and um, I think that he manages that with a lot of grace and dignity, um, while still kind of giving the people what they want, I guess, which is uh, oftentimes you know something uh, very similar, kind of over and over. Uh, certainly, galleries uh, want you to have that sense that your um, your work is manifestly similar over time. That way. They say like you're supposed to be able to recognize it from across the room, right? Um, uh, to like know that it's by that artist and what that means essentially, right? Is that like, 
that it just kind of uh, that you don't deviate from your from your look from your style. Um, by the way, I'm also just like looking at this and the proportions as I keep kind of pushing this inward, um, you know, to to kind of uh, um, look better actually in the feed. But but it actually like I'm actually like too narrow here. Uh, so there's a bit about the camera angle that is um, widening her up beyond the. Uh, uh, anyway, whatever. You guys don't need to know that. It's not interesting. Um, uh, somebody whose name I can't read or pronounce says, uh, will there be progress in drawing if you draw an hour a day? There's just no more time. Cool question. Yeah, I mean, obviously your progress is going to be proportionate in a way to the amount of time that you can spend. So if you draw five hours a day, you will probably make uh, a bit more progress. But um, it is one of those things where, for sure, if you spend some time with it, it's better than better than no time at all. Um, I would say it it will also depend upon basically what you spend that hour doing, which is like sounds like the most obvious answer ever. But what I mean to say by that is, like, if you're able to do one hour of drawing a day, I would probably suggest. Um, that you really try and brush up a lot on uh, on sketching and, and what it means to um, you know attain like a really good block in because you know getting to things like very fine rendering I, I don't know if you're really gonna do that in an hour a day or at least you know like I said like with a drawing that I make and this is after like many years of being a portrait artist you know a fully rendered drawing that I make of a head that's not like much bigger than this will take me, you know, like nine, 10 hours. So you figure an hour a day, nine or 10 days to, to get a head that's kind of rendered a bit. You know, and that's if, by the way, you get everything right on the first day, you know. Um, I think in general, like students probably can benefit a lot from doing uh, shorter, faster drawings. Uh, even if, you know, your goal eventually is to um, create like longer, more rendered drawings, uh, you need to find a way to like practice what you would do in the first 15 to 20 minutes of a drawing. That, uh, of course, is going to have a major impact on kind of what happens at the end of your, of your drawing. Let's see. Uh, Paul Aguilar says, what do you think of the Russian Academy method? I like it a lot, but I don't understand it too well. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's fantastic. I mean, obviously, um, listen, if you guys and girls out there are not following, uh, Ivan Loganov, um, go follow him. He's, uh, he's absolutely fantastic. Um, as I understand it, I think he teaches at the Imperial Academy in Russia. Um... And uh, yeah, no, I think he's really, uh, really brilliant, very expressive, and you know, without without being able to speak uh, too much about um, specifically their process, uh, you can see that obviously it, it profoundly relies on an understanding of like a three dimensional organic form. And uh, that is something that I find like super fascinating and really beautiful. And so I'm all in on it. In fact, like I would say a lot of my inspiration in drawing like comes from looking at things in very much in that way. Um, you know, it's such a like when I would refer to something as having like great sculptural qualities. Uh, that's what I'd be talking about is, um, is that it has this sense of... Uh, um, a believable, like, three-dimensional structure. It's so stimulating. I find it really, really beautiful. So, love Russian academic drawings. Let's see. I can need to get a drink of water here, guys. Sorry. Right, so, um, let's see. Someone's asking which pencil pencil do I use? I will have to refer to you as um, or refer to you, you to the FAQ link that is in the 
description of this uh, of this video uh, that has all the answers that you're um, looking for there. Let's see. Uh, Toby Michael's asking, do you follow any academic art meme accounts? Uh, I did for a minute um, follow some like academic art meme accounts. Um, but I like they're kind of interesting for a minute and then I kind of look at what I have on my Instagram feed after a while and I, I don't know, it's with respect to them is I think like there's a lot of them and a lot of them are like really, really funny. Like they're kind of like riffing on things that obviously are really, really relevant to me. But um, I go through phases where like I want my, my Instagram feed to um, be a little bit more inspiring to me rather than uh, just like another scroll. Um, and so I usually like unsubscribe from them at that, at that point. Um, I think they're great and all that stuff. But like I said, it just depends upon what I need, uh, what I need in my feed at that time. And I'm very happy to unsubscribe from, uh, from things, you know, just to, just to make sure that when I am there, like I'm getting, I'm getting what I need out of it. Because of course, like I, like all of us, right. I have, you know, time is precious and, um, you know, social media especially is not like always the best use of your time. Um, so I feel like my time's getting a little bit wasted. Uh, I get I get a little bit more protective of it. Um, but yeah, there's plenty of them out there that are that are really cool and they're usually you know the the thing you always wonder is like oh I wonder who this is. Um, and uh, yeah, there's no way to know, of course. Let's see. Mahir Bist says thanks for responding earlier. I use some hybrid versions of the Riley rhythms. How can I benefit? more from your video lessons and improving my art. You know, the thing about the, um, about any video lessons, and this is, here's the deal, people. <laughs> um, I think that the best, the absolute best thing that you can do is whoever you're studying with, make sure that you find the motivation to do the work. Now, what I'm doing when I do these sessions and the reason I try to have like the source image on screen and stuff, um, it's just so that you have an option to like draw with them. So the best way to get the most out of the tutorials that I make is make sure that you're drawing along with it, right? Even, um, even if it's like the, uh, you know, some of the early ones where I like, maybe I switch camera angles a little bit more and, uh, I wouldn't say it's like hard to follow, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, I would still say be kind of drawing along with them. Try and always implement the ideas that you're um, that you're hearing about because drawing, of course, is like a practical understanding, right? You know, there's this um, over the years. Uh, speaking of like memes, you know, there there's certain things that students will say about drawings, and I said them too. This is not like. I'm not just accusing the rest of the world, but I, you know, when I was a student, you know, there was things that I said and, and I find a commonality in, in, in things that other students will say, uh, because uh, at the time, you know, you don't understand in a way, like you kind of don't know what you don't know. Um, so you'll wind up like saying things that are, uh, uh, are just like not, uh, <laughs> not, not totally true. Um, but so like a teacher will come by, for instance, I'll talk about like, you know, when I was a student, so a teacher would come by and go, uh, you know, this, this, and this, and this are like not happening or, or they'll say that you need to think about this, this, and this. And I go like, yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I get that. I get that. But what I'm trying to do is yada, yada, yada. And what this takes for granted, of course, is like why the teacher would have said that in the first place. Like, you know, drawing teachers, they don't want to be redundant. They don't want to say something to you uh, that you already know. So if they see in your drawing or in your painting that you already understand this topic, probably they're not going to be bringing it up because they go, ah, I can see in this person's work that, that this is already a clarified concept for them. So when I would say to a teacher, you know, to my teacher at the time, um, or one of my teachers, there's quite a few at the academy. Oh yeah, no, no, I get that. But you know, I'm, I'm trying to do this other thing over here. 
I, I obviously didn't get that thing. I don't, I don't understand that thing, otherwise they wouldn't be bringing it up um, and trying to bring it to my attention so that I could focus on it and practice it. So, um, you know, just in terms of, uh, like, how to get, um, to, to bring us back to the, the question you're asking, like, how to get the most out of the, um, out of the tutorials, uh, is you just got to um, make sure that you practice them several times. Make sure you're drawing along with it so you can gain a practical understanding. And, you know, for all the, the times that people want feedback and things, you know, it's, by the way, it's very useful to have feedback. Um, but the feedback that you want to have eventually is actually your own feedback. You want to be so much in possession of the facts, right? Possession of the concepts necessary in drawing that you can look at your own work and you can figure out, you know, what's right and what's what's wrong based upon what you know. Um, and that's only that's only going to come, I think, through like a practical understanding of, of of what you need to do in drawing. Not not by the way, just to contrast that against like. Sorry, it's like a phone call. I should have like silenced my phone probably. Um, but uh, rather than just like a conceptual understanding of. Uh, of what's going on, right? Um, has to be has to be practical. Has to be in your hands eventually. Let's see. Um, MJ is asking, "Hi, Stephen. I'd like to ask you again about the balance of the visual and structural approach. What would you advise a student? Uh, really like everything that you do. Uh, you know, I think it's important to do both. Um, putting all of your stock into one or the other." Uh, is going to lead you very likely to have some shortcomings in in one or the other, and so uh, I think it's very important uh, that you that you focus on both um, as much simultaneously as possible. Um, which obviously is not always easy, but I think like. And by the way, maybe I'm framing this in the wrong way. Like maybe I'm saying this. And it's sounding like, oh, there's like a big difference in between, you know, visual and structural drawing. Ideally, a visual drawing will be very structural and will be very, uh, very sound in that respect. Um, like if you're doing it right. Uh, but of course, you know, there's this idea that they are a little bit separate. And, um, uh, and I think rather than that, I, I just try to figure out as much as possible where they overlap. That that would be my advice, right? Like how can you use half tones and, and shadows and things, which are deeply visual concepts, um, but use them to reinforce the structural ideas. You know, I think that uh, a lot of drawings that I look at and I think they fall short, or even let's say even my drawings that fall short, I think that usually they're either like structurally okay or they're visually okay and they're not both um and that obviously is not uh is not the ideal situation hope that makes sense right so Nell Mundo is saying, how do you train yourself on talking and drawing at the same time? <laughs> I get irritated when I need to speak to someone uh, while drawing. How do you, oh, wow, yeah, I don't know, I mean, so I've been teaching, I guess, since 2006. A lot of times uh, when you're teaching IRL, right, like in the studio with students, you're like going around and you're kind of drawing a little bit on their drawings and you're drawing on the, the edges of their drawing boards and you're kind of illustrating a bit your ideas to them. Um, there have even been times where I'll, I'd like carry around a, um, uh, like a pad of paper and that way I can like sketch while I like sketch out an idea or a diagram while I'm kind of working with somebody. And I think that, uh, Working under that pressure builds an equity that um, over time accumulates and uh, Nowadays, I don't, I don't mind so much drawing and painting. I'm I tend to probably be like a little bit less efficient When I'm uh, when I'm talking and drawing so like it'll probably take me a little bit longer to 
uh, dial something in uh, than it would if I was just doing it myself um, and, and not talking about it. But uh, yeah, I think eventually it's just those years spent, you know, sketching and, uh, um, and talking about students' work and kind of working on their work and stuff. So a lot of it's kind of tied up in that. Um, aside, aside from that, like, how do you train to do it? I, I don't know. I mean, just uh, put your phone in front of your drawing and uh, do a live stream on YouTube and just um, just get out there and see uh, see how it works. Like anything, probably experience will be your your best teacher there. But there's no, yeah, there's no, like, oratory advice that I, <laughs> that I have. Um, you know, I've, it's it's so hard, by the way, just to, like, steal the time away to like draw and paint. I, I know that, I mean, and I'm a professional, like I do this for a living uh, and it's hard for me to, um, you know, like earlier today, I'm like having like, you know, Zoom calls with like tax lawyers and things. And it's like, what does this have to do with drawing and painting? <laughs> you know, like life is not arranged uh, very well uh, to be like conducive to drawing and painting. And so um, you know, that's the thing that I find like most challenging is like, how do I just get the time to focus on the stuff that I want to do? Um, it's seemingly like so hard to just, uh, close out everything else and, and just focus on drawing and painting. Even, even saying that, like, obviously <laughs> I'm here on a live stream in a kind of professional capacity, right? Like, uh, this is, this is like, this is work for me, of course. Uh, it's work that certainly incorporates what I love to do. So there's, there's like a very positive aspect to it. And so I try and take that very much like as a blessing, you know, um, that at the very least I'm able to kind of combine them, but there's, there's a lot of aspects also of my job that, that don't really allow for me to kind of combine drawing and painting with, with what I actually want to be doing. So, uh, it can be an incredible challenge, you know, and I, I'm totally like with all you, all of you out there that like struggle to put together a few hours, uh, to like draw and paint. Like I, I, I totally get where you're coming from. It's one of the biggest struggles that all of us face. Um, and of course, you know, you're, uh, absolutely not alone in um, if you you know if you have a hard time uh, picking out a few hours to to kind of get to work and that's why I always say like with the with the lessons that I do you know um, it's important to, to to work along with them because it's that's like the hardest thing to uh, I think accomplish or achieve is like just to get that time to cut that time out to work which, by the way, is also like part of the reason why I wanted to do, I want to convert a lot of lessons into live events as because I've been told by, by patrons, um, like subscribers, that when they tell their family or whatever, or even if they're just making their own calendar and there's like a live event in it, like it's kind of understood, well, it's, it's a thing that's happening now, like, you need to be there for it. So you need to be able to like kind of close everything else out in order to focus on it. Whereas if it's like a lesson that's just on the site, you know, it's easy for anything to come in between you and the time that you've got to spend to kind of work on that. Anyway, that's my two cents on the, the whole thing. Um, by the way, a few people asking about my materials. Uh, if you're on IG asking about my materials, you can check my highlights for my link to the uh, FAQs post. If you're on YouTube, there's a link in the description of this video uh, that will take you directly to my FAQ post, which will tell you everything you need to know about all of the materials that I'm using, uh, the paper that I use, the pencils, it's even stuff about the oil paints and things that I use. So whatever you want to know, uh, it's in those FAQs. And if it's not in there, by the way, like drop a comment and I will, I will put it in the FAQs because um, I care enough uh, for the people I work with to know um, what I'm using and what they can use to, uh, to do their work better. Whew, so much talking. Um, Toby Michael had a question. Do you know much about Nick Alm and his process? Uh, yeah, Nick Alm actually was... Uh, I remember I was, so, so Nick Alm studied at the Florence Academy and, um, uh, I actually, 
um, uh, was his teacher on a, a few different occasions. Uh, and I remember another teacher I was talking to that, that, that I worked with at the time, we were having a conversation and um, the subject of Nick came up and this person said, oh yeah, no, I, I, was, uh, I used to be Nick Allen's teacher. <laughs> and in my experience, like when Nick showed up at the academy, he painted really well. And then he painted at the academy and he continued to paint well and got better. I mean, I feel like he could have showed up almost anywhere and he would have been just fine. So like to say that like I used to teach Nick Alm, I didn't used to teach Nick Alm. Nick Alm was a student at the academy and I was a teacher there, but he's he would have been been just fine with with uh, anybody teaching there. So um Nick works uh very uh very rapidly. Um uh this is partly due to his uh, obviously immense talent, um, but also uh, he's someone that uh, I think focused for a long time um, on what it was actually to paint, uh, I think quite quite rapidly. So uh, probably a lot of his paintings are made in a, a couple of layers. Um, uh, and uh, obviously some of them will take longer and things, but I think in general he works very, very rapidly. Now, I don't know anything about how he works in watercolor. Um, because back when, uh, I lived in Sweden, um, uh, he's Swedish by the way. And, um, back at the time that I used to, to hang out with him and, and know him, uh, I, I, he didn't do like a lot of watercolor back then. It was mostly, um, it was mostly oil paint. So don't know as much about that. Um, but I think his watercolors, wow. His watercolors for me actually are almost most Im more impressive than his, uh, his oil paintings. Not because like, you know, it's easy to say, oh, watercolor is a more difficult medium. Uh, I think that he, he has, um, his handling of it, of watercolor, I just think is even more unique than his handling of, um, uh, of oil paint, which is uh, obviously phenomenal as well. Uh, anyway, yeah, not enough to, not enough good things to say about uh, uh, Nick Alm. Really nice guy as well. Uh, let's see here. Sarah B is saying in the Riley method for figure drawing figures, uh, my feelings about the Riley method for figure drawing are probably the same as for portrait drawing. Uh, cool idea, uh, but it's not something I ever really assimilated um, maybe that uh, that deeply. Uh, someone's asking if I like to draw animals. Uh, I don't dislike it. Um, I, I am uh, a huge, oh, this is going to be divisive. I'm a dog person. Uh, I know there's a lot of um, I know there's a lot of artists out there that are cat people. I am a dog person, um, and I uh, love dogs. I've never been really drawn to making uh, work that represented animals, uh, but my wife and I will soon have a puppy of our own, and we'll see how that changes my mentality. I will probably be very excited to make many drawings and many paintings. Uh, of our uh, of our dog um, so uh, stay tuned to this channel and uh, you you'll probably be able to see my views about that go 180 degrees um, not that I have anything against uh, it at, at current but I'm probably going to become much more enthusiastic about it uh, very soon right so uh, Avalokit Alec asks, do you also get distracted with music while working? Because when I work while listening to music, I often get distracted. Um, yeah, you know, I was talking about this earlier in a way that I was saying that, you know, uh, I find that making work, I need to be, I find I need to be like a little bit detached from it, like emotionally, you know, if I'm too emotional, if I'm too excited, sometimes I just lose track of what I'm doing and I don't do it quite as well. And obviously that has uh, a negative impact on the outcome of the work and it sounds, you know, it makes me sound a bit like a killjoy. And I get that, but, you know, there is this idea of cold passion. It's not just about being excited. Uh, you know, you have to really execute when you make um, a drawing or painting. And if you're bouncing off the walls with excitement, you know, it's easy to get wrapped up in it and, and maybe you you know 
things like, oh, well, you, 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 know, you jump too fast into the details, so you advance your values too quickly, and uh, you wind up um, you know, with a drawing that, you know, a block in, for instance, that didn't get all the way done. Why? Because you're too excited, you're too passionate about what you were doing. Um, and so you kind of lose a little bit of that focus. Now, hey man, uh, everybody's going to be different and do their thing. And if, you know, passion is what drives you in drawing, I'm not saying don't do that. Uh, but just speaking for myself, um, I can say that I've just as often been kind of led astray by being too excited uh, as I have uh, been fueled by that uh, excitement. So hopefully that offers some, uh, uh, some insight into... Um, my feelings about drawing with and, and without passion. Let's see. Uh, somebody whose name I can't quite pronounce says, which artist influenced you the most? Different phases, different times. I think initially, uh, and it was painfully, painfully obvious, um, I was very in influenced by Egon Schiele. If you know his work, um, he uh, was a really amazing 19th century artist. Probably a favorite uh, among a lot of like uh, young, um, you know, like teenage guys because his work is like very <laughs> intense, very, uh, very emotional, um, very evocative, you know, and so there's like a lot of... Uh, a lot in it for um, for you know young teenage dudes that are feeling intense about stuff, um, which is probably just exactly what they should be doing. But uh, that's what I was doing, um, and Sheila was a really big deal for for me. Um, but as time goes on, you get interested in other artists, you know. Like uh, I don't know who's like most influencing me now. Like influence too is a tricky thing because as you grow and you evolve I don't, I don't feel like you stop being influenced but there's just such an accumulation of different influences and different flavors in your in your work that like one can't really stand out quite as much like somebody I really I really love looking at now and I, he also just put out a way it feels like everybody's putting out a book right now um Rupert von Kaufmann uh is this German artist Whoa, just eye meltingly great artwork uh to to look at uh quite kind of post modern post post modern but um still has a kind of a bit of a representational edge to it and uh I just can't get enough of it um but when you look at his work and you say like oh I'm very influenced by his work I don't think you'd really see his work in my, I don't think there's really any, any argument for, for one kind of looking like the other, but still I'm massively kind of drawn to, to what he does. So I think it depends. That's another thing about like maturing as an artist, I feel like is that I don't think you like stop being influenced, um, or you start to like, just get your own voice. I think that influence, uh, is just compounded. And uh, there starts to be so many of them that probably they don't stand out like they once did, right? Like, like when I was young and it was like Sheila was all I knew. Like you could see that Sheila was all I knew. Uh, and it was, as I said, painfully obvious. And so um, as I'm older, it's not that I don't love Sheila any less, but uh, there's so many other things that I'm looking at as well that I think are uh, what's the word? Um, flavoring my uh, my taste uh, for for drawing and painting, um, as well as uh, an abiding appreciation for for Sheila. Let's see. Uh, sorry, there's a lot of questions, and uh, I think probably we gotta like come to the end of the stream because I'm almost. Uh, like out of talking for, for today. Uh, it's always like I do these streams in the evening and I have to like, um, I'm the primary cook in the house. And so uh, come a certain hour, like I've got to start thinking about what to do for uh, for dinner, which is I'm sure it's like as a YouTuber, it's like really unprofessional that like at the end of my YouTube live stream, I'm like, 
I gotta go make dinner, guys, so uh, see you later. But that is the reality of the situation. So um, uh, I'm gonna look for another question in just a second, but we're probably coming to the end. Let's see. Um, let's see. Sorry. UCO is saying... After being exposed to so many speed paints, I'm stuck. Uh, I'm struck by how relaxed your process is. Part of me feels so anxious when painting. Did you ever struggle with getting into the right headspace to paint? That's a kind of cool question. Um, yeah, I think, you know, distraction takes a lot of different forms. And um, one of the things that that distraction, I mean, distraction can be literally like you're not focused. You've got other things going on in your life that are impeding your ability to, um, uh, to just spend your, all your energy on, on what you're doing. Another one, and, and this is kind of like, you know, I guess a bit of a theme we've been talking about a lot on this stream. Another theme is, is that like, you know, you can, your excitement in a way can be a little bit distracting. <laughs> like, um, you know, I, I get so into the, like in, it happens all the time in oil painting with students, is that you get so excited about color that you totally skip out on sorting out the value or the structure or, you know, some of the other kind of fundamental things that uh, are going to make your painting hold together over uh, over the duration of your, um, of your time working. So, um... Yeah, I mean, like, of course, I, you know, it is a matter of practice as well that, like, you can get a little bit more used to um, the kinds of distractions that you need to avoid. Uh, like I said, like, being a little bit overexcited is something I've been able to um, marginally diminish in the, you know, various uh, problems that I have in my work, but... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100%. It happens all the time. Uh, everything is a distraction. One of the distractions that is kind of like underrated as a distraction is like other people being in your head about stuff. Like I remember like the Florence Academy uh, where I went to school, you know, you get a lot of art students together and like everybody's got an opinion on what everybody else is doing. So... Uh, you know, there's all these like trends floating around of what's good and what's bad and what you can do and what you can't do. And it's really so easy. And this is any community. This is not about that school in particular, but it's any community of artists where like, you know, people that like to pipe up and talk about stuff. And this, there, all right, so there's one like thing that actually happened, right? So there's an exhibition and I have a painting in that exhibition uh, and I'm still a student at the time. And I'm, you know, really like, you know, nervously uh, exhibiting my work. And then everybody goes to the exhibition and everybody kind of hears everybody else talking about stuff and this thing gets back to me that somebody's like saying about my work. I don't, actually, I don't even remember what it was, but it was something like really scathing, right? Like something really just excoriating about the painting that I had in the show, which admittedly, like when I look back on it, it's not my best painting, not, not by a long shot, you know? Um, again, like I was, uh, was probably a second year student at the time maybe, maybe maybe a third year student and this thing stuck in my head to such an extent it was like a it made me paint worse probably for like a couple of years because it was just in my head thinking like I don't want my painting to be like assailable in that way like I don't want to I don't want to be able to be criticized for that like in the way that I was criticized for that. Um, you know, and it's just a matter of this like kind of unconstructive or, or non-constructive. I don't know which way you can put that, but it's just this matter of like non-constructive, unsolicited criticism um, that doesn't take anything into context. Uh, and it's even worse, I think, if, if you can hear it. I, frankly, I would have rather... In that particular situation, I would have rather never known, you know, what this person had said. Um, and it's somebody actually that I that I knew as well. Uh, and like I know, I mean, technically I know now. It's not a person that I like I see on a regular basis. Um, 
And I don't, you know what, I don't even think that they even really meant it that maliciously, um, but it's just the kind of thing that you say when you don't probably think that the other person will ever hear about it. And that kind of stuff really gets in your head. It's that kind of distraction um, that I probably found the hardest ever to um, get rid of to allow me to focus on the kind of things that will actually improve me as an, as an artist, you know? Um, there's a big difference between like constructive and non-constructive criticism and like as an artist and as a student, uh, you should be aware that, that both of them are, are out there um, uh, in great abundance. Um, and you have to really just manage yourself, I guess, you know, because the, the fact is, it's probably no problem with saying anything like that. Um, and like I said, I don't, I don't actually remember. I would tell you what it was, actually, if I remembered what it was, but it was some, uh, some like really critical thing about whatever. Um, but I don't think there's a problem with like saying that people should have opinions about art and should be critical about art and so on. It holds things to uh, a good and high standard. Um, but like as an artist, you also need to know like, as like a professional, you need to know like how to, how to manage that, how to deal with that. Cause it's not going anywhere, you know, like you'll receive probably as many negative comments in your, in your career as you will like positive comments. So I wish for all of you out there that you don't have to hear the, uh, the, the really, uh, uh, mean ones. Um. Uh, not that uh, again, you know, it's it's okay with uh, with a harsh. I mean, like I dealt with my fair share of like harsh critiques, like, and I think that was a point of pride actually around the academy was that we knew that we were going to this school where you would be really dragged over the coals, you know, by uh, by your teachers, and it was like this, in a way, like kind of a point of pride um, uh, to be able to kind of take it. Um, Whatever value that has, I, I don't know, I mean, but it was it was what we all kind of felt at the time, probably. Um, anyway, huge digression there. Um, but uh, let's, let's have one more uh, uh, good question here. Let's see. Let's see. Do, do, do. Let's see, Toby Michael's asking, um, what are your thoughts about Charles Cecil and the Barcelona Academy and GCA? Uh, I think they're all like really good uh, schools. They're all really nice schools. Um, I think that depending upon your personality, like one could be better than the other, um, or depending upon like what you want your work to look like. I, I, I do, you know, I didn't do this when I was a student. Um, but something that I feel, you know, quite strongly about now is, you know, you can kind of shop around, you know, you can look at what is the aesthetic of, um, of the teachers that are like working in the place where you're intent upon studying. Um, and if that aesthetic is something that you're very interested in, that's what you're going to learn there. You know, like, um, the work that comes out of a school, like if you don't like it, then for sure you probably shouldn't be studying there. I mean, or at the very least in the landscape that, that it is today where there's so many different places you can go. Um, like when I went and studied, there were probably three or four schools out there uh, that properly taught, you know, this kind of like drawing and painting. Um, and so you kind of like, you know, just roll the dice with one of them. But, and also like the, I mean, there was the internet. I mean, I'm not that old, but, um, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, like there was not as much, um, traffic I'll say, or not as much like out there about, uh, about the options. But I think nowadays, you know, look at, um, look at what the, the, the possibilities are for you to study and uh, try to compare the work that's coming out of various places, because that's exactly what you're going to get. You know, a school is uh, the sum of the concepts um, and instructors that are there. And uh, if those are things that you find you're not really that into um, and you have the option to shop around, then, you know, shop around for sure. Let's see. All right, this has got to be, we got to come to the end here uh, or, um, or I'm never going to 
Never gonna get through. Let's see. Ah, Phyllis Riley is saying that the FAQs do not talk about the colored pencils I use. That's totally true, Phyllis, and that's totally because I am a dilettante completely when it comes to uh, uh, colored pencils. So um, I wouldn't even know that my recommendations would be all that, uh, what's the word? Um, I don't even know that my recommendations of colored pencils would be all that great. I can tell you what I like and don't like about, about them. I have some from Faber-Castell and I have some from uh, uh, Derwent. Uh, I find the Derwent ones are a little bit my favorite, um, but the Faber-Castell ones are a, a close second. Um, maybe I will make an amendment to my, uh, uh, maybe I'll make an amendment to my FAQs to include, uh, even if it is a little bit of um, the opinion of somebody not so experienced, if you're just looking for what I what I'm using, uh, maybe I'll put that in my FAQs so you can uh, you can check that out um, uh, and see maybe to what extent you may or may not find it totally useful. All right, <laughs> Uziel uh, Ipinia says uh, I believe ethicality is important for critiques more for the person making the critique than for the person receiving. Uh, it's true, you know that. You know, there's like the Hippocratic Oath that uh, um, doctors take, right? That you will, you pledge to never do uh, harm to a patient. And as much as in my career as a teacher, I would hope that I could say something similar about that. I'm sure that I, I have, whether inadvertently or, or, or uh, in the worst case scenario, maybe I was having a really bad day and took it out on somebody. I'm sure it's happened. Uh, I'm 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 very human in that in that way, uh, and if you're out there and that was you, I'm very sorry. Um, but I I do believe that that it is very important for instructors to understand that, you know, it's it's not about like just working with really proficient students. Um, I think you really need to um, I think you really need to invest yourself in uh, um, trying your best to arrive. At the right place with the person you're you're working with, doesn't always work perfectly, but I think that's the ideal that we, uh, in a way, we we all try to to hold up. Um, I want to say though, also on the student side, because uh, at a certain point, <laughs> at a certain point, I was a really bad student. Um, I think that I didn't really know how to uh, study, you know, um, and especially like with artwork, you know, it can be very hard to like take uh, a strong criticism uh, to your work when maybe you're not really um, used to that or you're very insecure um, about the character of your work or, or yourself or in general. There's a lot of reasons why. Um, and so you can get in this game where you're kind of you're allowing your insecurity to uh, dictate what you can and can't kind of learn from a situation. So like some teacher had really offended me, you know, or said something that I thought was like way too harsh. And um, I would allow, I would like kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater a little bit. And because of that, I think I missed out on a lot of opportunities um, on my end. Now, obviously it's a two way street teaching. Um, so I'm not going to take like, just, you know, blame myself and go, oh, I messed everything up. Um, because, you know, uh, uh, it is about communication. There's people that are better communicating than, than others. Um, but I want to say this, uh, just in, in, in regards to like what it is about like learning and teaching. Um, you can, uh, in my estimation, take really great advice and do absolutely nothing with it and uh, uh or as a bad student right or as a as a person who's not doesn't study very well you can take great advice and do nothing with it and a really great student can take average advice and and make something really great out of it uh, so it is a little bit uh, about your openness and your kind of meditation on the information that you receive it's a big part of what makes for like a successful student experience um so i would just say and I, I was actually, I was just editing or re-editing a tutorial uh, today where I was talking about this. Um, so it's very fresh in my mind. You know, whenever you get an advice, 
whatever your initial reaction to it is fine. Uh, but whenever you get an advice, try to find the reason why it works, not the reason why it doesn't work. Uh, because someone is very likely saying this to you for a reason, for a purpose, um, especially if they're an instructor that you trust, you know, there's, there's going to be some intention there uh, for them to help you improve. Um, and if you meditate on, on, on what it is you can take out of it, for sure, you'll get a better experience than, than just to write it off like uh, straight away. Um, so that's probably, whew, uh, that's probably all I can do for today. Um, but uh, I want to say thank you everybody for, for showing up for the stream. Um, thank you everybody for, for putting in comments. If you want to learn more about, uh, my process, uh, in a medium that I know very well, like graphite or charcoal or oil paint, uh, you can go to my Patreon page. Uh, if you want to sign up for the drawing essentials workshop, part two is coming out February 1st. Uh, all you have to be uh, is a Patreon subscriber and uh, you will get a link to the live stream workshop. Uh, it's really information packed. It's about three hours of dense information, a lot of Q&As, um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to kind of sharing that with everybody. Um, if you like this content at all, you can just like and subscribe or like the video, subscribe to the channel. Uh, those things really help me on, on YouTube's algorithm. Uh, cost you nothing at all to do, so I would really appreciate it. Um, and thank you everybody for, for being here. Take it easy, all right?